Good evening. <laughs> you like our new music, Dave? <laughs> I, I, I love I, I feel I should be dancing or, or doing something manic. It's great. I love it. Welcome to The Liquid Antiquarian, uh, a show from myself, Arthur Motley, and Dave Broom, where we aim to tell the great stories of the great drinks of uh, the world using old objects, documents, and ephemera. And tonight it is the turn of rum, Jamaica, and Scotland. And uh, Dave is going to be in the presenting chair. I already have a glass of rum. Uh, <laughs> And uh, and I'm really looking forward to a subject that I know a little about, but not uh, not that much. So I, I suppose before we get cracking, Dave, we should ex explain a few real basics. That uh, rum is a distillate of well sugar in various forms. Uh, it could be fresh sugar cane juice, but in this case, the byproduct of sugar production, molasses. Yep. And it would be understating. It rather to say that it has a complicated and troubled history Oof. Um, and it is made in places like this this is a, a distillery in Jamaica um, and this is a, this is another old lovely postcard one of Jim Brown's um, uh, lovely. yeah much much older but um so Dave what tell us Yes, tell us about Jamaica, yeah, well, Scotland, and Rum. I've I've just poured myself a little tot, this being rum, of Smith and Cross. Uh, and if you look at the label of Smith and Cross, you'll see it says traditional Jamaica rum, pure pot still, so 100% pot still rum, plumber and Wedderburn. And it's that last name that we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, there was a bit of frosting in the bottle. I had it in the freezer because I'm going to make a little mixed drink later. And I didn't want to leave the room to go and get ice and do all that. So I've got nice kind of cold rum in front of me. And Arthur, I, I believe you are drinking something pretty Jamaican as well. Yeah, I've just had a sniff of the glass. and Yeah. Well, help me, Dave. It's assaulting me. This isn't just rum. This is an incredibly no. intense uh, yeah. and flavorful style of rum, which if, you, if you've never had before, you just wouldn't believe it. It's, um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm having a Hamden. Awesome. Awesome. And Hamden is something, uh, an estate that we will be popping into all the way through the talk. And I think uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, classic old style pot, Jamaican pot still. It is, and it's always hard to kind of do these things online uh, when the, people don't have a glass in front of them. But, you know, the description, the classic description is it's funky. You know, it's got big, big, powerful, slightly oily, almost slightly leathery, intensely fruity uh, style of, of rum. It's just a big beast of a drink. Uh, and we will find out exactly how that is made and where that comes from as we go along. But, boom. Stick yeah. your nose in that glass, and you know that this is Jamaican <laughs> rum. J just when you stick your nose in a glass of Art Beg, for oh, example, you go, boom, it's Art Beg, it's Isla. Jamaica, exactly the same. It's kind of the Isla of the Caribbean in that respect. Uh, I've heard it described as it's got that, it's got that wub, wub of a big <laughs> bass speaker yeah. that yeah. kind of shakes you to the core like a yeah, sound exactly. system like oh, here we go here we go but let's not get distracted in, into debating sound systems and and <laughs> get, get on with the talk because i could talk sound systems all night uh tonight what we're going to be doing uh dear dear viewers uh is looking at the story of rum through the lens of one particular family it's a story of Jacobites, it's a story of rebellion, it's a story of slavery, it's a story of Scotland and Scotland's uh, refusal to accept that it was involved in the slave trade. It's talking about distilling, uh, exploitation, abolition, and this mysterious emergence of a style named after this family, the Wedderburns. 
So I'm going to kind of split this up into two sections. There's not going to be an ad break or anything, but, you know, the, the, essentially into two sections. I'm going to start off uh, by, t by telling the story of the family, which takes us up to the story of rum up until about the 1830s, in fact, to abolition in 1833. And then the second part is going to be how this thing called Wedderburn rum slightly morphed into something a little bit different. Anyway, so... Let's get started. I mean, what, what, I, I, actually, at the very top, uh, what, what I'd like to say, I'd like to say big thanks to Matt Pietrick, uh, Cocktail Wonk, uh, who has done a lot of research in, into Wedderburn. And he and I have kind of been chatting about where Wedderburn style of rum came from for a long time. Matt's done a, gr a great deal of, uh, of research. Uh, a lot of this has been piggybacking on, on Matt's stuff. And we have been discussing this uh, over the past few months. So... Uh, and I think I've found a, a little solution, but huge thanks to Matt uh, for, for, for his help in, in this. Anyway, let's get started. Let's get started with Sir John Wedderburn of Blackness. There we are, Sir John Wedderburn <clears throat> of Blackness, uh, so 1704 to 1746. The 1746 is relevant, not just because uh, he died in that year, but in fact, he, he didn't die. He was executed. He was hung, drawn and quartered uh, in London. So John was a Jacobite. Uh, he fought in Culloden. He was captured in Culloden. He was one of the one of the leaders. And therefore, he was carted off back to London, uh, put on trial, obviously found guilty and then hung, drawn and quartered. Uh, end of that. So uh, an incredible. I, I, I actually completely forgot that. People still could be hung, drawn, and quartered, even you know as late as in the mid 18th century. A, a, a hideous way of, of, of being put to death. That's the end of Sir John. Obviously, Sir John had four sons, uh, and the first son uh, we want to be talking about is, uh, is his son, also called John, uh, and his son John of Balandin. He fled initially to France, then he fled to America, and then he ended up <coughs> in Jamaica in 1752 he was joined eventually by all four uh, all three of of his other brothers uh, only one of them actually survived james and we'll, we'll kind of talk about that i'm afraid there's going to be quite a lot of john wedderburns uh, <laughs> i apologize for this uh so we're going to have got john of valandine that's all you need to remember at this particular point so the wedderburn boys have landed in jamaica and a lot of jacobites end up in jamaica and they settle up in the northwest of, of the island, in the parish of Westmoreland and also of Hanover. Uh, so you can see that sort of right up there and in, in the northwest. This will become significant, I think, as we begin to explore the flavours of what became known as Wedderburn rum. Uh, so there's something about the uh, dare I say terroir of this particular area, which I believe helps to contribute to, to what became known as, as this particular style. Why did they end up there? Well, because you've got to remember that uh, Scotland and England, there's a union between Scotland and England only started in 1707. Uh, prior to that, Jamaica was owned by the English. The English had taken Jamaica from the Spanish, as it was part of the Spanish Empire, uh, for a while. They, they took it in 1655. The Spanish weren't interested in sugar uh, at all. Uh, the Spanish mm. used their islands in the Caribbean as essentially tr uh, as as trading, not even trading posts, uh, but, but, but as stopping off points. Uh, to take the treasure from Mexico, Central America, uh, South America even, uh, stopping off in Cuba initially in, in, in Jamaica and then moving on in, into Spain. So they were kind of stopping off points, waypoints on the way. The Spanish weren't interested in a mercantile empire. They were interested in gold. They were interested in, in purely finance. Uh, but the British and to... Another extent, the Dutch and also the French, they were interested in establishing a mercantile empire and creating goods in these new colonies of the Caribbean. And the main source of that income was going to be sugar. So you've got to remember how important sugar was, and we'll kind of move on to that uh, as we get down. So the English have already established a colony, uh, make a, growing sugar, uh, 
refining it and then also making rum from the middle of the 17th century onwards. <clears throat> the Scots, therefore, are going to be late arrivals. They're only coming at the beginning of the 18th century and then a big influx in the kind of post-Jacobite era, post-1745. All these states down in the south and east of, of the island had been taken already. So therefore, the Scots tended to move to the north and tended to move to the west. So it's a kind of greater concentration of the Scottish uh, settlers uh, in that part of the island. Again, this is going to become uh, relevant. So, John of Ballandine. Uh, so, who was he? Well, the son of John of Blackness. He arrived in Jamaica. He claimed to be a surgeon, as did his brother. There's absolutely no evidence of that these, these men ever had any medical treatment whatsoever. So, I hate to think what they were doing to their patients uh, when they arrived in Jamaica. Uh, but he, in, he came into inheritance in 1752. And in 1752, he began to buy or indeed establish estates up there in Westmoreland. So uh, estates such as, let me remember, Blackheath, uh, Blackness, uh, Blue Castle, and the wonderfully named uh, Glen Isla as well. <laughs> he left Jamaica uh, in 1768 and moved back to Scotland. Uh, and this was fairly common uh, for the time. His brother moved back roughly the same time uh, he had shared ownership with, with those estates as well. His brother was called James Weatherburn Colville. Uh, he'd taken on his wife's surname because uh, she actually had more money than he had. Uh, therefore, he ended up back in Scotland, bought Inveresk Lodge, uh, which just outside Edinburgh, rather grand country house, and settled back uh, to uh, a life of riches because sugar was booming. You could make a huge amount of money out of sugar. And this this idea that that people would Scottish people would leave Scotland, emigrate to Jamaica, uh, work in the sugar industry, and then come back to Scotland was actually the very very common practice uh, at, at this point in the eighteenth century. We're called sojourners. You moved over there for a short period of time. Uh, you took employment. You, if you were rich enough, you bought an estate, or you began to, or, or perhaps you, you worked as a middleman, you worked as an overseer, you worked as an estate manager, uh, you were a shipping agent. Uh, you know, all these different jobs began to emerge. And again, something which is really only, I think very recently been, been, been talked about seriously is that the amount, the influx of Scots into Jamaica during the 18th century. By 1774, Arthur, a third of the white population of Jamaica were Scots or of Scots descent. And that wow. is that is unbelievable when you it's think incredible. of the percentage uh, of Scots uh, uh, or Scots as a percentage of the British population. You know, so, you know, a huge, huge influx of, of, of Scots. And have you, have you any idea what kind of scale of population there was in Jamaica or, or, or emigrants over there? Is uh, this... A score of people, a hundred people, it's, it's hard to say, presumably. Oh, no, I mean, thousands, uh, you know, ten thousands, uh, you know, ten thousand, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of people, a significant number of people. This is, you know, you know, you know, this is boom time in Jamaica. You know, I, I, we, we don't think of it in that way. You know, this is people going over because they can be made rich. Boom. You know, it's a gold rush. Except mm -hmm. it's a sugar rush uh, in the different <laughs> sense, <laughs> the different sense of, 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 of the term. And another, and another I, sorry, yeah, one yeah, of yeah. The, I was just going to ask, and I, I heard that one of them could have been Robert Burns. Yes, yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, Burns was set to head over to Jamaica to become an overseer, you know, which is again something that. Uh, is perhaps glossed over uh, in Burns, you know, a man's man for all that, you know, the, the you know the great the great proto proto communist, uh, what was going to go over there to look after slaves, uh, and he stopped, and I think because of love. Uh, oh no, he suddenly became successful actually. I think his poems uh, were just published. So there's this kind of ambivalence uh, even within Scottish society, the people that you think of as being great liberals <clears throat> in Scotland in the 18th century uh, often turn out to be uh, tacit supporters of, of slavery, which is something we're, we're going to be coming on to in a second. Uh, and looking at you kind of nosing that glass there, Arthur, of Fine Hamden, one of the other families that, that went across were the Stirlings, the Stirlings of, of Keir and Codder. 
<clears throat> Archibald Sterling uh, moved over there uh, again post Jacobite era. Uh, he owned the Frontier Estate and he also owned an estate called Hamden, which is what you're drinking there. Uh, and there is the, the front elevation of the grand house, the big house at uh, Hamden. Uh, that is uh, part of the Glasgow City Archives, which is at uh, in the Mitchell Library. A lot of the Hamden uh, information uh, has been digitised, so uh, if you're interested in that, uh, uh, go along to that. It's relatively, it's actually very easy to, to access. So uh, I, I, I just thought that that's another kind of important one to remember because Hamden will keep popping up. And what the Stirlings of Keir did, and also what the Wedderburns did, was control supply, control the supply chain, both in Jamaica, making the sugar and making the rum, and also importing it, making goods and making the goods and shipping the goods back out to Jamaica as well. The Stirlings were a very powerful and significant Glasgow family by the mid uh, 19, mid 18th century. And something that we forget, something, you know, I, I'm from Glasgow. I, I, I was always told, I was always taught about the tobacco barons in, in, in Glasgow and not really understanding who the tobacco barons were. But, you know, Glasgow's wealth was initially built on tobacco. Boom, boom, boom. Nobody ever talked about sugar. But mm. sugar was a significant, sugar was infinitely more important in building uh, Glasgow's wealth. In fact, in building Scotland's wealth uh, than tobacco uh, ever was. And something that has that, again, I was never educated about, and I don't think anybody in Scotland was educated about until really very, very recently, was all of Scotland's wealth in the 18th century and into the 19th century was built on the back of chattel slavery. And the thing was... Did you, that, say, did you say all of? Okay, I, I might... I, I, um, I might, I may have exaggerated slightly, but okay. a significant, a, a really, really significant amount of the money being made by Scottish firms can be traced back to chattel slavery. Firms becoming rich off the back of it, investing, uh, investing in industry, investing in banking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It all comes from the sugar trade in some form or another. And it's mm. something that Scotland has been incredibly bad at, 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 at owning up to, at admitting. It's not taught in the schools. It should be taught in the schools. And the reason for it is that Scotland, Scotland or Glasgow, especially because Glasgow was, you know, as it's on the Atlantic, therefore the, the port where the sugar and the rum was going to be coming into, it wasn't a slave port. You know, so we kind of go, oh, no, we weren't involved in slave trade. We, there was no slaves going through. There, there was a handful of, of, of actual slaving vessels uh, which left Glasgow, and that finished in the middle of the 18th century. L Liverpool, yes, slave port. Bristol, oh, Bristol. Yeah, yeah, slave port. You know, and I, I lived in Bristol for, for a while. My wife's from Bristol. You know, you're, you're, you're aware of that fact you know you're brought up to understand that fact that you know that this is a disgrace of on, on that city in glasgow oh, no, no. <laughs> nothing to do with us you know we're great liberal scots we fought for abolition uh, but no glasgow's wealth was built on the back it was kind of one step removed and those planters uh, such as the sterlings became incredibly wealthy incredibly powerful they became philanthropists they they founded banks, they built themselves large estates, they built the necropolis. Uh, you know, all of this, you know, the great and the good of Glasgow. Glasgow drinking clubs started up, celebrating the outward bound trade, you know, of young men voyaging out to, 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 to find, seek their fortune. All that money coming back into the city. Hooray, you know, we are rich, we are middle class. And we can sit and we can drink rum punch uh, out of fantastic punch bowls. That was the punch bowl uh, from the Saracen's Head, the Sarahid, uh, which uh, so was a fairly disreputable pub in, in the Gallagate. But in those days, it was a very, very high-end coaching inn. Uh, so that's the uh, People's Palace in Glasgow. The great punch bowl, fathoming the bowl, celebrating uh, th th that, that trade. So really, really important that Scotland is now beginning to 
address this and beginning to understand it. It's been some great uh, television on it. Uh, uh, my friend Don Coots and Davey Heyman uh, did a lovely one. Uh, there was a, a beautiful documentary last week about the uh, the Melville statue in St Andrew's Square uh, and uh, Sir Jeff Palmer, incredible man, and, and his campaign to, to get a proper plaque up there. Uh, Dr. Stephen Mullen, uh, you know, who, who I met earlier on this year, written a couple of great books. Uh, there's lots of academic research going into Aberdeen University. has done a lot, so it is beginning to emerge. Uh, but you know, it's taken a hell of a long time. I must say, for, it, for, for Scotland to to come to terms with the fact that yes, it became a successful nation because of slavery. I must say, uh, just some personal reaction uh, initially. I'm obviously English. I, I grew up in Oxford. I, I, I'm not as posh as I sound. We all sound like that down there. <laughs> but um, been in Edinburgh for over 20 years now, have Scottish kids. Um, you've gone the other way. You're, you're, you're down towards Brighton, the other end of the island. And I must say, I feel, you know, all my pals are Scottish now. You, you kind of feel when discussion of the empire comes up that... They somehow still associate me more than them mm. with that British empire. Yeah. Um, I feel like perhaps, especially if people who don't know me so well, I feel like the conversation might go a different way if I wasn't in the room, as if I might be the kind of person who, you know, just by, 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 by then being English, that I would associate with the Union Jack more than they would, or Will Britannia, and all those kind of elements, almost like there's a, um, it sounds strange to say it, Scotland, but like a superiority complex, a you know, back of the mind psychological stuff, that that somehow wasn't them, even mm. though Scots w would regularly talk about, the achievements of the Scottish throughout the empire and how they did contribute enormous amounts to technical innovation, yeah. adventure, all these kind of elements. Yet this, you are quite right, Glasgow is not discussed in the same breath yeah. as Bristol, Liverpool, yeah. Colston, no, uh, what happened no. recently. What, was there anything when when the, 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 there was a Colston statue? Was, was there much in Glasgow? I didn't see. You know, the, 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 what's happened in Glasgow has been a lot of renaming of streets, or mm. uh, you know, Glasford Street, Buchanan Street, mm. you know, uh, the Stirling, Stirling Library, which is the Gallery of Modern Art in in, in, in Glasgow, <laughs> built by the Stirlings of Keir. Uh, it's so there, there's been. There's been discussion in Glasgow. Uh, there's not been any kind of great uh, trying to tear down statues because, again, it's not quite understood because it's it's hard to get it across. I think because I think as a Scot, you're brought up to have this kind of bizarre, almost like moral superiority over the English. You know, especially when it comes <laughs> in the em in the empire. It was called the British Empire, but it's essentially the English Empire, and and the Scots kind of did the good bits. You know, so so yeah. brought. It kind of brought civilization, uh, <laughs> and, and and we like playing the underdog, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, as a result of that, it's quite easy because of that element. I, I think within Scottish society, it's quite easy to sweep all that nasty stuff away. We're not racist, no, no. That that's down south. We weren't slavers. That was them down south you know we only did good all around the world we were abolitionists you know etc etc and it simply isn't true you know history is a filthy subject and we have to address it it's as simple as that and and, and, thank, and, and thankfully this this year you know and, and i still find it ridiculous and i remember you know i was i watched the film about rock against racism uh the the, the other the other week and the the great Victoria Park gig with the clash and everything. I remember going down to. I'm that old. I remember going down to going down to that that gig, uh, that and having having the big anti Nazi league march and etc cetera, etc cetera, and rock against racism. And I was watching with my daughter who was 19. I said, "Well, oh, yeah, but, you know, I was there. You know, I did that." She was going, "Oh my God, you were there!" You know, and and I thought, yeah, I mean, and I'm really proud I'm there. And at the same time, I'm utterly devastated that all these years later. We're still going. Racism is bad, you know, and it's 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 mind blowing, and and you know, I I find it deeply, deeply, deeply disturbing that, that mm. we, we still haven't got that out of our system at all. 
Well, I think the problem is, and actually something you said in the Champagne episode about uh, postcards being like the social media or the Instagram of their time, hmm. that, that, that triggered a thought as I drove around these last couple of days. And actually, I, I, I wish I'd responded they were more like the newspapers of their time because yeah, yeah. that beautiful photography, newspapers didn't have much photography. They obviously, as we will see from the very small print later <laughs> on, <laughs> ink was expensive, but these postcards somehow commercially could. But I suppose in the Black Lives Matter movement, the statue terror downers, the statue defenders, social media allowed no room for nuance and... Mm. The reason I bring it up is that's kind of what I'm proud of, the, you know, just a small amount of stuff we've done recently. It is allowing room for nuance, discussion, but mm. all social media does is kind of face, uh, Facebook and Twitter line up like a, you know, like a, like a row of impassive yeah. riot police and ask people to stand one side or the other and lob 140 characters into yeah. each other. Yeah, it, 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 it's a complex it's a complex story and it's one that has to be faced up to and one that has to be discussed. But, but, but you know, as I, I, I know you agree, the bottom line is slavery was wrong and racism was wrong and we've got to get rid of both, you know. Yeah, I think we're there. Slavery, hopefully. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, just before you carry on, yeah, you yeah, just yeah. give me a favour, just double check your connection of your microphone yeah. just on the side. I'm getting a tiny bit of crackle. It might not be that. Uh, it would bug me if I didn't ask you just yep. to check. Yep. Uh, everything, yep, is, everything's plugged in. So, okay, great. Carry on, okay. please. Okay, right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Right. So now we're going to move to another member of the Wedderburn family, uh, who guess what was called John. Uh, it's a bit like the Grants of Glen you know. George and John, John and George. Uh, so this is John Wedderburn of Spring Garden. He was a cousin of John of Ballandine, who, who we saw earlier, and also James Wedderburn Colville. Wedderburn of Spring Garden was the most acquisitive in terms of his states. Uh, by the end, by 1789, he's owning uh, 10 estates, some of which uh, he's inherited from his cousins. Uh, so Spring the Garden, Edgecombe, Paradise Prospect, uh, Jerusalem, Burnt Savannah, uh, Retreat, uh, again, all of which were up in uh, Westmoreland and Hanover. So by this point, uh, and this is an important point but when it comes to assessing why this style began to emerge, the Wedderburns are incredibly powerful in this particular part. They are dominating production, sugar production and rum production in this particular part of, of Jamaica and exporting it directly from the port, which is uh, Savannah de, de, del Mar okay, up, up there. Uh, John of Spring Garden, once again, was a sojourner. He came back relatively quickly, having established the, the, those estates and joined the family firm, uh, Wedderburn and Wedderburn, as it eventually became. Uh, who were based at 35 Lidenhall Street, uh, which is relatively close, relatively, uh, relatively close to, to the Thames there. Uh, and in 1799, he's one of the, the main investors uh, to build the West India docks. So rum is beginning to flood in because rum, so much rum is coming in, there's going to be uh, a docks and also essentially a trading position. Uh, on the on on the Thames, which is you know right slap bang uh, in 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 middle of London, pretty much where, where the city is now, and they raised those uh, rum importers raised half a million pounds in those days Whoa. to to build those docks. Now that's how much money w w was coming in it was coming into Britain at, at that particular point that they could afford all that money to be able to build some docks because so much sugar was coming in, so much rum. Uh, was coming in. And this, you know, John of Spring Gardens kind of ushers in, uh, I'm kind of loath to say it's the glory years of the of the firm, but it is the glory years of the firm. You know, from a financial point of view, this is when they are making their most money, the, the most of their money. They're owning half a dozen ships, they've got fleet, they're controlling production in this particular part of, of Jamaica. They are rolling in the money. John pockets £10,000 in the money uh, of the time in 1810. The other directors who included his, his nephew by, by that point, £5,000 each. And the fine, and, and, and the salaries grow and grow for, 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 for the ne next few years. Uh, 
All of this is built on the back of slavery. We have to remember this. You know, you kind of go, oh, my goodness, they were the great and the good, and, you know, they, they did all this. And, well, isn't it nice to, to kind of celebrate, you know, the, the, this, you know the, the entrepreneurship and the financial acumen of, of all these people? They were slavers. Fuck it, they were slavers. Uh, and what was beginning to come in from a rum perspective was this wider range of what in the rum trade we call marks. So that each estate would have its own literal mark. So it could it was like a shorthand for it's coming from this estate. And also within the estate, if a number of different styles happened to be made, they would be marked in a different way, usually by letters, but you could see on this, this is a, a, an advert from the, uh, the morning advertiser of its time, uh, good old MA. Uh, you also had little diamonds, perhaps, or lines, et cetera, et cetera. So if you were buying, if you were a wholesaler, you, you would know what the marks meant. You would know who that was coming from, what estate it was coming from, and also what style it was going to be. So there are some of the, the, the Wedderburn marks which are being sold by this person called uh, T.G. Ramsey, who's going to be the middleman, who's going to be the wholesaler selling off uh, in, 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 into the trade. <clears throat> Pardon me. And by now, by the beginning of the 19th century, you're beginning to see adverts in the, the papers uh, written in insanely small type. Uh, <clears throat> For for Wedderburn's rums, uh, thankfully you, you've highlighted uh, that one there, Arthur. Thank, thank, <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, so so looking down there, so you've got Port, you've got Madeira, you have a uh, oh double voyage East India Madeira, you've got cognac, you have Jamaica rum, and th this is really significant for me. You've got good Jamaica rum, and you have Wedderburn's very old Jamaica rum, first marks, i.e. the best marks, the highest quality. Guaranteed three years in bond, bonded warehousing uh, starting, maturing starting uh, at this point. So all drum is coming in. I, I've seen ants for 10-year-old Jamaican rum, which are contemporaneous to that. So maturation is understood because the rum industry, oh, did they fall into it? Perhaps they fell into it, but they, they just it was an observable phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> as you call it, that if you had something this colour uh, coming off your still and being put into the cask, by the time it had travelled across the Atlantic, it was going to be this colour and it was going to be mellowed and it was going to be different. So the knowledge of maturation sprang from that. And I think it's something that's forgotten in, in terms of Scotch whisky. You know, we kind of go, oh, you know, Scotch whisky, when did Scotch whisky start being matured? As we found out on Monday... Essentially, from about 1823 onwards, it was organised in that particular way. Rum was coming in from the middle of the 18th century, the beginning of the 18th century. The, the knowledge of maturation and, and cask mellowing was understood uh, in, in the rum industry. Therefore, the rum merchants could charge a higher amount of uh, uh, money for their spirits because they were considered of high quality. Hmm, that's uh, fascinating. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's a consumer insight. I, 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 as marketing people would love love to say that you know if you think of and we're drifting off into whiskey here, but if you think of the target consumer who's going to be your middle class consumer uh, for whiskey, who's used to be drinking mature rum or mature cognac, and suddenly being given immature whiskey. What are they going to stick with? They're going to stick with what they know because it has already been mellowed. So, so, so it's really important, and it's this. The this is the height of rum's popularity. You know, people were people loved rum. There was rum coming from all across the Caribbean. the The knowledge of distillation was, was incredible. Uh, you know, this deep understanding of cool distillation, uh, long fermentation, cask mellowing, everything that we understand in Scotch, uh, start in rum. Anyway, uh, to continue with... Can, the, I, can I just yeah, ask, yeah. so yeah. transfer of knowledge and how that... Did, were they learning in Jamaica? Or do you think they came with that knowledge? No. The, 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 um, they learned there. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you look at... The, 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 there's some remarkable uh, books... Uh, uh, Planter's Guide uh, it, it is, is one of the great ones. Uh, Long's book, which we'll talk about in, in, in a little while, uh, really detailing uh, 
quality distillation, uh, mm. understanding it, working out how to make the best quality stuff. You know, it, it, they didn't kind of, they may have had a knowledge of distillation, but they refined that knowledge because they wanted to make a better product because there was demand, mm. it was consumer demand. Anyway, as proof of the Wetherburn's power, by the 1820s, you can see that they are the second largest importer uh, in, in, in the docks. This is our parliamentary report uh, to ex actually extend the docks because sales of cognac were, were disappearing because of war. Uh, sales of rum or imports of rum were, were rising. So there you have Wedderburn, one, two, three, fourth down, uh, second largest uh, importer of of rum there, a powerful, powerful com uh, company. But decline is on the way. Uh, you remember that John of Ballandine I mentioned earlier on, mm. Arthur? Well, mm. when he returned to Scotland, he brought with him a slave, a slave called Joseph Knight. In 1774, Knight challenges for the right to leave his so-called employment. Uh, and be given back wages. Uh, he wanted to settle down with the family. He, his partner was pregnant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, slavery wasn't legal in the UK, therefore he he felt he he could he, he was right to petition uh, for, for his freedom. Wedderburn uh, throws his pregnant partner out and slaps him in jail. The court case still goes ahead. Uh, Knight loses. Knight appeals to the Perth Assizes and wins, uh, the judgment being that the regulations in Jamaica do not cover the law in Scotland. Wedderburn then appeals against this, and he appeals to the Court of Session in 1778, and that, that uh, petition that you, you showed there which from, from the National Archive is the, is, uh, the Joseph Knight uh, petition. Court session, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with Scottish law, is like the Supreme Court uh, of Scotland. You can't go any higher than that. Twelve judges sat in judgment and found in favour of Knight. This is a really, really important case in helping the abolition movement forward. So the Knight case is really important. Knight versus Wedderburn is is uh, an absolute marker in, in the, the fight towards uh, abolition. And then Another Wedderburn comes in. This is Robert Wedderburn. Uh, Robert Wedderburn uh, was born in Kingston in 1762 as the illegitimate son of James Wedderburn Colville and a slave called Rosanna, uh, who was sold to Lady Douglas uh, in Jamaica when she was five months pregnant with Robert, on the understanding that when he was born, he would not be a slave, he would be free. Great. Uh, he joined the Navy, he became a uh, tailor, he conceivably ran a brothel for a while. He was a preacher, he was a radical, he fomented armed revolution. Uh, and in 1824, he writes this book, The Horrors of Slavery, which is one of the great fir first great tracts, and uh, this is the frontispiece of that, uh, one of the first great tracts uh, against slavery. Basically uh, outlining his, his own upbringing, his dreadful upbringing, uh, at the hands of... <clears throat> and how his mother was treated uh, by, by his father. He then also wrote another pamphlet called The Axe Lead to the Root, uh, which was directed at, uh, at the slaves and indeed the planters in, in Jamaica. So a radical, radical person. He was condemned by his half-brother, Andrew Colville. Andrew Colville uh, has now taken over Wedderburn. Uh, Colville owns all the Wedderburn estates, plus another nine, and other estates across the Caribbean. He's an immensely, immensely powerful man. Uh, he dismisses all of Robert Wedderburn's claims, but I'd like to think Robert Wedderburn wins out. 1824, the same year, one of the Wedderburn ships sinks, and what you're beginning to see is the slave uh, is, is the, the imports of sugar and, and the money being made from rum slowly beginning to die away as you move into the 1820s and into 1830s. The firm's fortunes are beginning to decline. Uh, and I think some of us, we know, those of us, if you hear about slavery, you hear, well, well, you know, the slave trade was abolished in 1807. Yes, but slavery 
itself was not abolished until 1833. And one of the ways in which uh, abolition, full abolition actually managed to take place was the Great Reform Act, uh, which took place, which uh, more abolitionist MPs joined the Houses of Parliament, but also a compromise which the abolitionists had to make kind of through gritted teeth that the only way that the abolition bill could pass parliament was if the slave owners were compensated for their slaves, which essentially said that they did own them in the first place. Mm. Uh, Colville pockets £26,452 for 1,500 slaves. That's three million quid in today's money. The Stirlings of Hamden, uh, and this is from the Stirlings uh, family website. Uh, Stirlings had high hopes that their Jamaican estates would be extremely profitable, but the harsh working environment, riots and insurrections, such as the, the, the Taki Rebellion in 1760, which is the first great slave, uh, slave rebellion in Jamaica, uh, ensured that the estates were never as profitable as they had expected. The emancipation of slaves, which occurred in 1833, quickly made these states unprofitable. That is on their website today. <laughs> they got almost £4,000 for the 229 slaves that were at Hamden. They got almost £8,500 for the other plantations. One and a half million quid that they pocketed. Unprofitable. You know, it, it, it's kind of, you know. Uh, I, I, and all of this information, by, by the way, folks, uh, I'm kind of flinging loads of stuff at you. I apologise. Uh, well, I don't apologise because it's a story that's not really been told. All of this information is at the Legacies of British Slave Ownership, which is on the University College of London website. Search it, seek it, look it out. In fact, look at your own families, conceivably your own, your own family's association. Uh, it's interesting to see what, what does come up. It's an extraordinary piece of research and, you know, immense praise to, 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 to the researchers at, at UCL for, for, for giving this amazing piece of data, uh, you know. And, you know, as evidence of that, you know, the, let's go to Hamden, you know. Let, let, let's see what that slave list looked like. Mm. Yeah, so you've... you've that's said people, a bit. you know, yeah. that's, that's lives. Yeah. You sent me... Uh, a lot of these images to prepare for this and I kind of I look at them through you know squinting because I don't want to find out what you're talking about but this one I just had to kind of I had to dwell over it. it's um it's quite incredible so off to the the, the main element that takes over the the, the left hand two-thirds of the image and then the, the, the right hand third of the image is blown up effectively because there were just Something. Sorry, do you mind me talking about this right now? No, Dave? no, no, right. no, no, no. On you go. On you go. Give you a. I'll give you a rest. It's um. Yeah, I just felt. I just found it so moving just to see all those names there. Those into Bella, Delia. Uh, looks like Luki there. Or Suki maybe Marina. But then you see over on the far right hand co column some of those ages: eight years old, seven years old, seven years old, three years old. So, and then some just comments about them to, towards the bottom, wooden leg, invalid, <clears throat> midwife. But the one that really broke my heart is, uh, I think that's Mimba. Mm. And just next to them, the word worthless. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, 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 yeah, you're right. It breaks your heart. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so important that, that, that these documents are, are there. Again, this is coming from Hamden Records uh, at, at Glasgow. Uh, yeah, there, there's there, there's an, some evidence of the human cost. You know, it's putting names to the people rather than it being this kind of abstract thing. Uh, these are people. Mm -hmm. uh, and who even in gaining their freedom were still effectively their their owners still profited uh, from their existence. You know, it, it's utterly utterly sickening. Mm. Worthless. I just that, that word really yeah. really yeah. really struck with me. Yeah, I, I and you know fine well that they weren't worthless because mm. he, they would have got some money for even that worthless slave. Mm. You know, great. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we're moving on to kind of the second part of this, uh, which is how the Wedderburn rum, the Wedderburn marks, began to kind of morph into this idea of there being a Wedderburn style. Uh, and it's interesting ha having a look at this because as you begin to move through the 19th century, so rum's popularity begins to go on the wane. By the 1850s, it's still very popular. People in you know in Scotland are drinking more rum than they are drinking Scotch whiskey, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But slowly but surely, rum's status as being you know the drink to go to is on the wane. Cognac revives until phylloxera hits. Scotch whiskey, especially blended Scotch whiskey, begins its uh, seemingly inexorable rise uh, around about the 1880s uh, onwards. Irish whiskey is big as well. Rum begins to, to fall away. Apart from some Jamaican rums and specifically Wedderburn rums. And there's some really interesting ads uh, at the tail end of, and it's roughly from the 1880s, I did my best. I did my best yeah. for these ones. Days. I mean, I mean. You, you know, it, it, it's insane. You know, I don't understand how people read the newspaper in those days <laughs> without magnifying glasses. You know, uh, but you know, if you look in there, in, in the one in the middle there from the Kelso Chronicle, there you have George Smith's Real Glenlivet Whiskey uh, at two years old, uh, plus Wedderburn Rums. You've you got mentions of Kalila, Ardbeg, Ardlussa, Royal Brackla in there and Wedderburn rums. So even at a time in the 1880s when rums popularity is beginning to slip, you're seeing in top end, and I've got a whole bunch of these, you're seeing in, in top end grocers, uh, around top and top end wine merchants, what you're seeing is Wedderburn rums still maintaining a high price and a prestigious position within the, the the growing world of, of spirits for, for the middle classes. So although rum is slipping away, there's still this differentiation between Jamaican rum and Wedderburn rum. And the British palate was very, very wedded by, by if you pardon the pun, uh, was wedded to that, that Jamaican style. So Wedderburn for me has become a style by, by, by this particular point. So where is this flavor coming from? This is a thing that's really, really bugged me uh, for, for ages. And I think it comes back to the location. I think it comes back to this, this mysterious thing called terroir. Because think about where they were uh, in Westmoreland and Hanover in the, in the Northwest. And Edward Long uh, wrote uh, an account, a three volume account of, of Jamaica in 1774. He was a truly horrible man. Uh, you know, huge advocate of, of slavery. You, you read his account uh, while kind of holding your nose, really, uh, because it is an amazing account of what plantation life was like, uh, what a planter's attitude to slaves was like, and also how rum was made. So you kind of got to read it. Uh, and what he says, and I'm afraid that I, I can I can get the the, the actual faded paper that, that we both love. Uh, what he says, and in many places in the north side. The soil is so rich and the rain is so copious and frequent that the syrup, molasses, here is so viscid that it often will not boil into sugar. But these estates produce an extraordinary quantity of rum. The south side lands, and I, I paraphrase here, are better suited for sugar. Quick thing about rum production. Uh, you take your sugar, you cut your sugar cane down, you crush the cane, you take the juice, you boil the juice. When you boil the juice, the sugar crystallizes. You take off the crystals, you boil it again. Crystallizes, take it off, boil it again. Boil, boil, boil. Keep boiling until it will stop crystallizing. What you've got at the end is treacle, is molasses, and that when you add some water to it, because the sugar concentration is still really high, and add yeast to it, you can ferment into a beer and distill into rum. That's rum. Essentially, mm -hmm. that, you know, some rum production really, really simplified. And what fascinates me here is when he says on the north side, he is referring to areas such as Westmoreland and Hanover, rather than rather than on the English side. And there you have this really thick, thick cane juice that's coming out. And I'm thinking, well, if you've got this very different 
style of juice, you're going to be making a different flavor of rum. And I was speaking with this with, with, with Matt Patrick, and, and he, he made the very perceptive point that actually the cane variety might be different as well. And also the wild yeasts, because it's all wild yeast fer ferment, uh, the wild yeasts are going to be different as well. So therefore, all these different circumstances come together to produce a style of rum which is different, which is unique to that particular area. And that area is dominated by the Weatherburns. Therefore, Weatherburn is no longer just a shipping company. It is a style of rum, a type of rum. But what about the concept of Dunder and all the, the yeah. things I know about Jamaican rum? Yeah. And, and is, is this in action as well, do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 From the word go, uh, Dunder is used. So, so they, they, let me kind of uh, explain Dunder. You know, uh, this, this kind of funk, this hogo, this is stinkabus. Uh, as it was called uh, in, in those days. I'm taking a little drink of it because it's so good. That is helped uh, by the use of dunder. Dunder is essentially pot ale. So it's a residue that's left at the bottom of a still after distillation. It is highly acidic. You take that, you add it back into the fermenter, it changes the, the pH of fermentation it allows the yeast to get to work so it's very useful for using wild yeast because they often quite have to be have to be encouraged uh in, 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 in into working and the longer that ferment goes on the more that acid level is going to going to rise and when you have acid and when you have alcohol meeting together you create these flavor compounds called esters and esters are fruity and the longer you leave it the more intense and high toned those fruity uh, aromas become at the Hamden estate, which we just had a look there, which is the most ultra traditional uh, uh, Jamaican pot still uh, estate, they also add uh, the residue from the muck pit. Uh, and the muck pit is everything that has been in the tanks and the distillery when the distilling season ends. And that's all flung into a trench outside, and that trench is never emptied. Uh, Naysbury's, jackfruit, bananas are all added in there. That helps with nitrogen. That is then taken out for every ferment. There's going to be a, a certain amount of muck. There's going to be a certain amount of dunder. And this long natural, this is still wild yeast ferment uh, uh, distillery. High strength, aromatically powerful. Boom. Highest yeah. uh, Jamaican rum. Yeah, um, I mean, my, my glass yeah. does smell of muck and dunder. No it's great. It. <laughs> yeah, it's it's awesome. You know, it, it's addictive. It's addictive. Yeah, it's like you you got had a giant fruit bowl. Yeah, yeah, and then you got it, yeah. bananas and pineapples. Yeah, you went off on holiday, forgot about it for a month, <laughs> and then came back, and that's what yeah. you got. Exactly, exactly. I, 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 yeah, I, and the weird thing about it is that it's not a the weather run style. Uh, for me, becomes the style of rum. The, the tail end of, of the 19th century because because the family farm has essentially disappeared uh, by, by by this point uh but not in jamaica so, so I, i've been kind of forsaken around the, trying to find when when weather becomes known as a, a as a specific style of rum in jamaica and I, I found three potential um entries for this the first one is the sale of the minty state which is a Weatherburn owned estate and you can see there it says about halfway down or two-thirds of the way down the rum is a Weatherburn brand and commands an excellent price in the market. There we go. That backs up that point. Uh, but what does Weatherburn brand mean? Uh, well, it could just mean, you know, it was owned by the Weatherburn estate. It was their brand. Or it means it is a brand insofar as it's a style of rum that is made there. I'm not very sure what that one is, but I, I thought that's... Uh, potentially intriguing leads as I'm still digging into that one. The second one is one a letter from Fred Myers of Myers Rum uh, talking talking about the, the, the high and the more pungent uh, character of, uh, of Weatherburn rums. Uh, so there's 19, in 1921 there is Fred Myers, a uh, famous famous uh, rum, rum shipper and rum producer talking about the specific flavor characteristic of this style of rum, which is known as Weatherburn rum, uh, which by then is not just coming from specific estates, but coming, but but, but being made as a style. And the final one, uh, which is again from the Kingston Gleaner, 
1927. Uh, there you have kind of three definitions. Uh, the, actually going from common clean number three at the bottom there, generally favoured in the north part of the island. Uh, and that is kind of, that's light rum, essentially. Uh, column still, uh, very clean, as it says there. And then in the middle, plumber and Wedder Wedderburn. We're not going into plumber. Uh, it's too complicated to, to add yet another family involved. And that's rums from Westmoreland and surrounding districts. Rich flavoured rums, too rich for some palates, the most frequent in the English market. And then finally, German rums, which, which are known as the, the, uh, the continental, oh, yeah, yeah, get, get continental flavoured ones. So by the 1920s and 1930s, what you see in Jamaica is a classification uh, taking place uh, within Jamaica, defining the styles of rum which are made on the, made on the island. Common clean as being light, uh, plumber uh, as being this kind of moderate ester level, Wedderburn, uh, more punchy, pungent style, and then this continental flavoured stuff, which is fucking loopy juice. Uh, you know, and you know, continental flavored is used for flavoring, basically for flavoring tobacco or chocolate uh -huh. or patisserie, uh, or added in small quantities to straw rum, uh, which you get in, in German, Germany and, and Austria, not to be drunk on its own. You not know, to be I, drunk. I, I, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've done, I, I've done many ester tastings, and it's fascinating. And you get up to that level, and you, it's you know, phew, it blows your head off. You have a drop of that and add a huge amount of water to it. It's an amazing pineapple character that, 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 that comes through. And mm. all of these classifications are classified by ester levels uh, in a slightly inaccurate way for it doesn't actually define flavour. But by this point, Wedderburn rum, and again, and it fascinates me that it's coming from Westmoreland, uh, defined as this punchy, estery, funky style. And all the way through uh, rum's evolution, there's been this battle against the funk. Uh, and it's kind of, I often think it's kind of George Clinton perhaps wrote the, the, <laughs> the, the greatest analysis of, of, of rum production ever, you know, because, because in, in, in his Parliament albums, it, there is a character called Sir Nose Devoid of Funk, uh, who, who is trying to stop funk taking over the galaxy. Uh, and, <laughs> and the nose devoid of funk uh, is what shippers are trying to do from the 18th century onwards. They don't like this. It's a difficult style to make. You let that run away and it becomes undrinkable. You, you're, you're skating right on the edge of, of acceptability when you're pushing those levels up, uh, when, you're, when you're adding dunder. You can tip things right over. But when you get it right, you've got something like the Smith and Cross, which is all that kind of mink oil, you know, you know, character, you know, the pineapple-y thing, this big camphor thing coming through. Camphor, camphor's classic, isn't it? Punchiness is a six-month-old uh, Wedderburn from Hamden Estate. And a uh, uh, year and a half to, th to three-year-old plumber. Uh, which is adding that, 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 that kind of fruitiness. But, you know, all the way through rum's history, you know, rum, rum islands, Barbados, Antigua, etc., we're going, we don't make Jamaican rums. And you see this 18th century onwards, we are doing it differently. We don't want that, that filthy, funky stuff. That is Guyanese distillers who, who really perfected uh, distilling by the tail end of the 19th century, making beautiful, beautiful rums, which are reaching fetching less money on the market, even though they were so well made, are ranting uh, about the fact that this <laughs> filth from Jamaica uh, was coming out, you know, in much the same way uh, as you see people kind of rebelling against Campbellton whiskies or, or, or Islo whiskies because, yeah, they're just too, they're just too weird. They're, 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 I, was, they're, I was a way to say it, we might do so, particularly Campbelltown. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that's filth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the nicest possible way. But, you know, as as George Clinton says, you know, the funk is its own reward. Dig it, you know. And so, by to, to just kind of wrap this up, uh, by the nineteen forties, what you're seeing is 
Wedderburn rums exported pretty much exclusively to the UK. UK still has a has a taste for these bigger, heavier rums, along with navy rums. Uh, whereas the rest of the world, if they are drinking rum at all, uh, are tending to go for for the lighter style of rums, Cuban rums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here's an ad from the Derby uh, Evening Telegraph, 1941. Uh, there we have Lemon Heart, great, great brand, also Jamaican-based Weatherburn. Uh, Gilby's Jamaica rum. So again, you've got Weatherburn as a different style of rum uh, coming in here. This, this is during the war. This is 1940, uh, you know, when the all clear signs to drink rum. <laughs> you know, you cannot argue with that, can you? Uh, you know, and, you know, by the 1950s, well, yeah, you, you're seeing... Wedderburn rum uh, with orange uh, added, rumminge. Uh, that's what's a smashing drink, says, <laughs> says, says, says that that old buffer there. Uh, adding fruit to, to rum, not, uh, not a new innovation. Uh, I've got records of Wedderburn rums with uh, pineapple juice uh, being added to them in, in Jamaica. Uh, so, you know, flavoured rum, not, not a new thing uh, in any way whatsoever. And we kind of move forward to uh, uh, in the, there's a lovely kind of slide there that, that, that you've got of uh the grants bottle this is grants of northern ireland uh of weatherburn's uh jamaica rum there then this is from this came up for auction i think that's probably a 1950s uh bottling there and smith and cross uh which which i which i'm drinking now uh which is one of the first rums uh in recent times to actually put Weatherburn and Plummer on the label again, because people are becoming interested in it. People are becoming interested in in the funk. Uh, whiskey drinkers in particular uh, latch onto this because it is big, it is powerful, it's obvious. Uh, and this is exceptionally well made. So th this is made at Hamden Estate. Uh, extraordinary rum. Yeah, absolutely mm. extraordinary rum, and you know this whole kind of roller coaster that, that, that rum's been on. I, I remember writing my first article about rum, and I think nineteen ninety four, ninety three, ninety four, when the Atlantic Bar and Grill just opened in London. Oh, did yeah. a tasting, did a tasting down there, <laughs> as it was still being built, of of gold rums, uh, as they were called uh, at the times, which which were beginning to come in, in coming to UK and and. Writing, rum is the next big thing, and I think I, I wrote that essentially the same line for the next decade at least. Uh, finally, I told you so. <laughs> rum is rum is really uh, on the ascendancy again, and people are really wanting to know about its production, about the, the extraordinary variety of different mm. rums which are out there. There's ten distilleries in Scotland making rum. And making excellent rum uh, in in Scotland, and trying to get a definition uh, for for it. Amazing, amazing rums coming from all over the world. Uh, yeah, and and rum aficionados uh, starting up. Uh, I remember, you know, one of the first times that we kind of worked together, Arthur was. was I, it, I was just going to say, what, 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 what was it whiskey fringe? Yeah, you know? it it was a lovely yeah. way. It's a lovely way to bookend this series. We did, we kind of didn't do it on on purpose, is it? but that was kind of how we first. You know, yeah. got drunk together and kind of bonded. Was in the in the rum chapel at Whiskey Fields. Yeah. yeah, the rum chapel. You know, <laughs> and, and 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 it was. You know, some of you might get that joke, uh, and it was. <laughs> And it was, it, I just loved that because you had people, you had whiskey drinkers coming up, going, "I know nothing about this. Give me two or three. And we were rammed, uh, you know, all the time. But people just coming up, wanting to know about rum, wanting to know about rum. And it's great, and, and it's continuing. And this big, funky uh, Jamaican style, yep, uh, that's popular, but it's not the only style out there, guys. You can explore rum. But the most important thing, uh, I think, and uh, one of the things, again, to kind of bookend the, the, the whole talk, is that as you begin to look into rum, <clears throat> don't just look at the process. Uh, the liquid antiquarian, you know, as antiquarians, we want to look at the reasons why these flavours are there, how they've evolved, what are the hidden stories? And the hidden story behind Hamden Estate, which has created this, these amazing rums that Arthur and I are drinking, is not as 
wonderful in singing or, or singing or dancing as you might think there's a lot of uh there's a lot of awkward truths to to be faced in rum and we have to explore it we have to explore mm. it and, and and we have to we have to hold up our hands and go yes we we were part of it and we have to we have to talk about it mm. uh, dave thank you so much i really appreciate there was a lot of detail in there for people, but I think that is essential. You, mm. We need that detail. You can't just throw something out there, uh, you know, in, in a few sentences. It's such a <clears> big <throat> and important subject that, you know, pe you hear people say, oh, you're not talking about this again, are you? We yeah. haven't spoken about this in Scotland. Um, no. uh, hardly at all. So I really appreciate the, the, well, the skill with which you've done it. I, okay. I've learned so much. No, and, no, that's um, great. I, I'm just it, making myself a little corn and all. Oh, I love a corn and all. And <clears throat> that kind of brings us towards the end of our first week of uh, Liquid Antiquarium, which has been quite a week, isn't it? It's, it's been awesome. I've really, really enjoyed it. I mean, I knew I would enjoy it, but I, I think, you know, I, I hate to, you know, I'm Scottish and you're pretty much Scottish, to be honest. Uh, we don't like <laughs> blowing our own trumpets, but, but the response oh, has proud. been... The, the response proud. has been amazing. Uh, so thank you, people from all around the world who've who've tuned in because we've loved doing it. And to be perfectly honest, we would have done it even if nobody was watching it uh, because we just love we love this shit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I've I think thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it. As we, this week, we've kind of we haven't had time to talk about this, but I think we've really started to find out what it is as well. We, we've yes. been talking about this for a long time, and at the end of these three episodes, Ooh. it's quite different to what I kind of thought it was. And it, yeah. it all seemed to be um, about objects and kind of physical mm. things, but increasingly so much it seems to be uh, about people. And these yeah. objects, mm. I, I was thinking... Um, and it's maybe the time of year, but I'm thinking like the, the, these objects, they're like, they're like little, um, oh, little photographs. Amazing. They're like little, well, not little, they're like big fireworks in like a, in a kind of black sky. And it must yeah. be the time of year where I'm thinking of this. And you kind of, they're so beautiful and you kind of look at them and stare at them. But actually, which was the point to kind of send up big fireworks into the sky, but actually... And I am a bit pissed now. <laughs> <laughs> it's strong stuff that happened. Yeah. It is. Actually, it's not the firework in the sky. It's the kind of light that it casts on the la landscape around these, these objects that we throw up uh, that kind of illuminate context and just give you that little insight mm -hmm. into what life might have been like for these people. Um, they, these are fantastic images. No, and, and yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, and we will continue because we've got ideas uh, from next one. We, they, we've had loads of suggestions from people and offers of help and uh, documentation uh, coming up. We haven't even scratched. We, we've barely knocked on on Jim and Linda's door uh, in terms of. <laughs> well, the, we can't the, right now. Yeah, yeah the, <laughs> the insane resource uh, that, that that's sitting there. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to to how, how we're taking forward. You know? Well, well, that's the other thing that uh, we found out about Liquid Antiquarian is so many offers of help, so much encouragement, and that is so appreciated. It really, really yeah. is. Why are we doing this? Because we had to, it's a compulsion. But the support and the encouragement we've been getting from people, we knew booze geeks would be interested, but it's been great how it's been finding favour with other people. And that is one of the other elements that we're really finding about this is contributions from people. So these last little series of uh, uh, of run postcards, um, that's uh, they've come from a chap called Johannes Breit. Um, I will share the link to his Instagram uh, page. And he is a huge collector of rum and sugarcane related postcards. And he's been incredibly generous. I only remembered him last night 
I emailed them last night. Oh my God, we're doing this episode. <laughs> and in the morning, I had all these beautiful postcards, oh. more, more of which I will show you. And and we are very much up for collaborating with people, getting people's input, and seeing where this leads. So we're going to go away now, aren't we, Dave? We're definitely going to do a week in January at the latest. Yeah. We may do a few small little mini episodes. And um, we've just been so, so so grateful for the positive feedback. Yeah, th- thank you so much, guys. And, and just to say, here we are. Uh, Peter loved the series. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Neil McKenzie, he's been he's been really, really really supportive as well, and he is he is a right. professional more than we are. Um, Michael uh, Keown, who would have appreciated that Northern Irish bottle, I'm sure. Um, a world without fun, funk. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Sean Russell, you've got him away from Sherry Bomb whiskies. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, uh, I've so enjoyed this week. And I've I loved hope, it. Yeah. Very soon, I hope to be sending more of these little fireworks up into the sky and seeing what, what, what light it casts. Um, and we'll, just before we roll the credits, uh, a particular big thank you to... Barnaby Taylor, who has had to actually rewrite some music because after two episodes, <laughs> we got managed to get into a copyright dispute with Disney. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're, Big time. Big time. <laughs> we are making waves. And also uh, Brune, who, um, uh, who, who put the credits together. So uh, is the kestrel around? Have you got any birds around? Brune's a fan of them. There you go. Yeah. There's a kestrel for Brune. Good night, everyone. Thanks again, and uh, see you soon. Cheers, Dave. Love you, man. Cheers, Arthur. Go on.